I'm off camera. I'm getting something very special. Oh, yes, that smells wonderful. You think I could do a sermon titled Hungry and not bring food to the table, right? Is that mean? Is that mean? That might not be mean. It's a little bit funny. It is. Once you find out what's under there, it's really funny. Is anyone hungry? Hungry? So I have a, a small confession to make. I mean, some of you may have already known. Um, a few weeks back, I did a, a sermon titled uh, Soul Detox, or at least that's what we talked about a lot was detoxifying the soul. And I'm like, yes, such a good message. We could do a whole series on toxic things and uh, I just felt convicted instead of focusing on the negative that we need to be focusing on the positive and so we shifted instead of uh, most of the world knows what the church is against but we should be standing up for what we are for and so I, a big shift in the direction so the sermon series we're starting today is hungry and the, the logo that you see here behind is kind of a spin-off of the, the, there's these viral videos called Tasty, where they show you how to cook something in like two minutes, and they throw all this stuff in. And, and, and that's sometimes the way we try and prepare our spiritual meals, is by just throwing stuff together. Oh, let me see, Lord, what should I read today? And Judas went out and hung himself. <laughs> Go and do thou likewise. <laughs> That's not the way we throw our spiritual meals together, okay? When you, <laughs> That's not how God leads you for your word of the day. Let's, uh, let's turn our attention to him and let him lead us in our word for the day. Amen? Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this opportunity to really dig into your word. And this whole series, Lord, we ask that you would lead us to the things that truly satisfy. That we wouldn't get caught up with fancy words or what just seems to be a cool message. But Lord, let us see the truth in your word. Let us chew on it. Let us meditate on it in your name. Amen. In fact, this was something that even Fran the other day was talking about in her Bible studies, how there's some challenging words sometimes, we're, and we have to not just skim over, but we have to really chew on it. So turn to your neighbor and say, chew on this. <laughs> chew on this. Chew on this. So yeah, the, 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 our focus often lately has been on what the world is doing wrong, and God wants us to have us refocus on what God calls right so that we might hunger for it. We, uh, we recently um, were interviewed by Focus on the Family um, regarding uh, purity sessions and uh, a com purity commitment that Charity had made when she was just a teenager to save herself for her husband because she was reading these magazines from Focus on the Family called Brio and how much it impacted her life that she wrote a letter to them just to say, hey, thank you for bringing out Brio again. And they, they wanted to do an actual video interview of her. And one of the comments that the interviewer made was how so often this message of purity has been misunderstood. Um, and even in some cases caused damage because the message of purity is so focused on don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, and hasn't really focused on, well, what should you do instead? And I shared the verse a couple weeks ago about how when we, the, w the devil has noticed that the house has been swept clean and it returns and it's not been filled with something else, not been occupied by something else, that it goes and gets seven of its buddies to come in and occupy your house and you're in a worse situation than you were before. So often people make this commitment to purity of what they're not going to do, but they don't make a purity of what they should be doing 
And as a result, they end up in a worse situation than if they hadn't made the pledge in the first place. So um, I want us to focus on what are we supposed to be eating? Because the reality is, as a church in the world, we have malnourished Christians. Not because they're not getting good word on Sunday, it's just that's the only word they're getting. If you only ate once a week, would you be strong? <laughs> you wouldn't be. I can tell you, physically, if I don't eat and then I go to the gym, my body shuts down. Seriously, I black out. I start, oh, oh. I've started, I'm being faithful, I'm going to the gym, but I have to eat because if I don't, oh, oh, real quickly, I'll just pass out. And you, it's not a pretty sight seeing someone blacked out. It's not. So we live in a, a world that is hungry for truth, and it's chasing it in all sorts of different ways. And you know what they come up with? Let's see how many of you really know the world. I can't get no satisfaction. Who wrote that? What's the song? Rolling Stones. I knew you would know that one. <laughs> How did I know? You look like a Rolling Stones kind of guy. <laughs> Back in the former life, right? <laughs> what about still haven't found what I'm looking for? Still haven't found what I'm looking for. I still, yeah, there you go. I was going to start singing it. Thank you for saving me. Uh, <laughs> still, never mind. Uh, my guitar. So you, so you fun fo young folk who don't know who the Rolling Stones are, or you two, ask your parents. Good fans, but not really. Well, anyway, talk to your parents about them. So there's this dilemma that we all search for right now. You know, everyone wants to drive the fancy car, have a nice home, have a good family. And yet, even after having achieved all of that, we find ourselves restless, bored, hollow, empty, still not satisfied. And in fact, there's an entire book in the Bible that's dedicated towards this dilemma. It's the book of Ecclesiastes. It's written by a King Solomon, considered to be one of the wisest men of all time. And he was going through a bit of a midlife crisis when he wrote it, because he had achieved so much. And the, most of the book is a bit of a downer until the very end, where he expresses that really life is all about God. He had, he had it all. He had riches. He had power. I mean, he was the king. In fact, he was considered to be the, the richest man on the planet at the time. He had the accomplishments, he had fame, but he still wasn't satisfied. So he decided he'd try something a little bit more extravagant, and he took his money and he took his riches, and he turned to try and have fun. He invested in wine and women, big emphasis on women. He had like 400 concubines on top of his many wives. Dude had a lot of women. And, and he, wisdom struck at the end and said, uh, yeah, this is not a good idea. So, you know what it means to be hungry and not satisfied with what you're going through. I mean, any of you ever woke up at night hungry? What do you do? You just lay there in bed? Man, I'm so hungry. I wish food would just fall into my, no? We, you get up. Anyone ever been so hungry that you have to get up in the middle of the night and get food? And you go to the fridge and you just open it. And then you just stare in the fridge. Because even though the fridge is full, it, it, there's nothing in there that you feel like is going to satisfy you. So what do you do? You close the fridge, you go lay back in bed. And you're still hungry. And you get up and you go back to the fridge, expecting that something would be different in there. We're still hungry, we're still not satisfied, and we stare. You, you know, you're looking at the options, and often we know what we don't want, but we don't know what we do want. It's like when you leave church and you turn to your spouse and say, so honey, what do you want to eat today? I don't know, anything. <laughs> what about this? No, I don't want that. Okay. <laughs> what about this? Uh, no, no, I'm not in the mood for that either. What about this? No. Well, what do you want? I don't know anything. <laughs> You ever have those moments, right? 
sometimes you know exactly what you want, right? You ever think about a big, juicy hamburger? Some people don't like hamburgers, but my son knows if he goes to a restaurant, he's not sure if he orders a hamburger, he's probably going to be satisfied. You get, can you picture what that hamburger looks like? How many like thin smash hamburgers? Thick, juicy hamburgers? Some people don't like hamburgers because there's only three people that had an opinion. So, the rest of you must like medium-sized hamburgers. <laughs> Double stack? Triple stack? I got to tell you a story. When I was in Bible college, I went to Wendy's, and I came back for my lunch break with two of their triple stacks. And I had a friend, Big Mike. He was about seven foot tall and 400 pounds. I'm maybe exaggerating a little bit, like two inches. But he was a big dude, and he saw me eating. He's like... You're eating all that? And I was only like 150 pounds at the time, sopping wet. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to eat that, Big Mike. The next day I saw Big Mike, he had four of them. He's like, <laughs> <laughs> Big Mike could pack them away. So we're staring at the fridge. We're hungry. We don't know what we want. We do know that we're hungry. So the verse that I'm going to be starting with, Matthew 5, verse 6. And this is the middle of uh, how to live a blessed life. Anyone want to live a blessed life? The rest of you really... You don't want to live a blessed life. <laughs> That's really stink. How many don't want to live a blessed life? How many want to live a blessed life? Yeah. This is a participation church, just so you know. How many want to be blessed in their life? I am blessed. I thank you. If you're not sure, then Matthew 5 is a great place where it talks about how to be blessed. And it's interesting because it says, blessed are those who are hungry. So, some people are like, eh, I'm not hungry, I've got my word. Well, maybe you're not blessed. You should be hungry for more. Blessed are those, Matthew 5, 6, blessed are those who are hungry and thirsty for righteousness, for they shall be filled. There's, there's five words in that short verse that stick out to me that I'm like, I could really dig in and chew on this. What does it mean to be blessed? What does it mean to be hungry? What does it mean to be thirsty? What does it mean to be righteous? And what does it mean to be filled? And many people are hungry for a lot of things, but I find that most of them are not hungry for righteousness. They're, they're hungry to be right. Or rather, they're hungry to be validated. They want, we want our opinions to be approved by someone else rather than for our opinions to be corrected so that we can actually be right. We'd rather be told that we are right rather than to be made right. And that's what righteousness really is, is about becoming right. Be hungry to be corrected. Now, that seems like something most of us don't really want. We don't like correction. We don't like to be adjusted. We don't like to be made right. And the disciples also had a misunderstanding as well of what they were supposed to be hungry for. Jesus was right there with them, and they were hungry for the kingdom of God, but they had a misunderstanding of his kingdom. They, they understood that Jesus' kingdom was going to be right there, right now, a physical castle, palace, and that he was going to raise up a physical army to overthrow the Romans because they were under captivity. And when Jesus says, I'm going to set you free, they're like, yeah, we're going to be free of these Roman scum. And what he was really talking about was making them free from sin. Amen. That's the kingdom that we're supposed to be hungry for is his spiritual kingdom. To be hungry for the lost. To be hungry to see his presence in our lives. You know, when you're in the presence of something like good food, it rubs off on you. When you're in the presence of bad food, it rubs off on you. You know, you go into some people's homes. I used to install home security uh, systems in people's homes. So I went in a lot of different people's homes. And when I would leave that home, the essence of that home would be on me. And I'd have to go to someone else's home. And they're like, what have you been smoking? <laughs> like, it's not me. 
you know, you go to an Italian's home, you might smell like tomato sauce and basil, and you go to an Indian's home, you leave smelling like curry, and, you know, you start to smell whatever you, you are around. So, and sometimes we try and cover it up, too. This is one of my favorite smells. Miguel, can I, can you come into my presence? I love you so much. My brother, my family. Come on back there to... Go, go and be my witness to the whole world. <laughs> Take that on around. Chris, you get a good sense of smell? I hope, can, you, can you smell, see what Miguel smells like? Can you smell that? Church, can you smell that? Pathway, everyone? <laughs> Some kind of fuel, did you say? Perfume. Perfume. Come up here, Chris. <laughs> Just... Just a question, is that what you smell? Was that what you smelling on him? Yes. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> we are carriers of his aroma. You know? We have to spend more time with him and getting hungry for what he is about. And it will go with us beyond. But if you only go once a week into his presence, then you're carrying some other sort of funk. The Bible says that his word is either a sweet-smelling aroma or the stench of death. But he wants us to be the aroma of heaven. So this first word, blessed, makarios. Makarios is the Greek word. And it says that it comes, when I was doing the research, it's more of a poetical extended version of a shorter word, makar, which means the same thing. And I started thinking, well, what, what's a good comparison of that in English? And normally when I'm thinking about food, I say that's delicious, but I want to make it sound extra delicious. I, I can't think of a good English word that has the same root, so I start speaking Spanish. It's deliciosos, mm. or delicioso, whatever, right? I'm not, I don't speak Spanish, I'm sorry. But the food, delicioso, right? It's, it sounds better when it's longer. So it's a poetic way of saying, Blessed, or sometimes in English we add unnecessary syllables like blessed. It just makes it longer. You ever do that? Or some preachers, when they're talking about God, he has three syllables. God, ah. <laughs> yeah. God is so big. He, he doesn't need my extra syllables. But the word blessed, is it basically means abundantly blessed. Uh, it's adding extra emphasis. It means to be happy. Um, so he wants you to be blessed. Hunger is the second word. Penaho. Yeah, penaho is the Greek word. Interesting translation. It, it came up in the dictionary as a pinching toil. Pinching toil is the word literally translated. We know what pinching is, right? Turn to your neighbor and just pinch them in the arm. Not arm, not too hard. No, don't twist. Just pinch. But you know, if you get that that pinch and then someone twists, it's extra painful. The toil is the painful part, and the toil is like to to work is actually to have long hard work. It's your laborious effort. Some people are overworked. It's like my toil was for in vain. You know, old English. So um, strenuous. Fatigued labor. So to hunger, you've got that painful twist. You ever been so hungry it hurts? That's what it's talking about to really be hungry for righteousness. Not, you know, I should probably do good things. But to actually be hungry to the point where it hurts. To need it that badly that you're going to hunger that way. I mean, true desperation, that you would really eat almost anything. 
or you would do anything to eat. I think about that desperation of hunger, like when we see some of the children, starving children in third world countries where they're so hungry that their bellies have actually swollen, not because of having so much food, but the lack of nourishment and truly starving, truly starving. I think about how once a week is not enough, which is such a shame when we just sing these songs about how God is Jireh. Jireh is the Hebrew word, which means he is our provider. God is our provider, yet we're starving. That doesn't make sense that that can be the case, that he is able to provide, yet we simply choose not to. And when Jesus is preaching here, we have to remember this is only one chapter after a time when Jesus was truly experiencing hunger. He's preaching this shortly after he had done 40 days in the wilderness, fasting. Matthew chapter 4, we're going to read, read a little bit in there. Matthew chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. This is when Jesus had gone out and the devil came to try and tempt him several times in different ways. said, why don't you just turn these stones into rock and eat them. Why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? Finally, he took him up to the top of a mountain and he tried to tempt him again. So Matthew chapter 4, verse 8. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he said to him, all of these things I will give you if you would just fall down to your knees and worship me. And then Jesus said to him, Get thee, Satan, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. See, Jesus knew the difference about what kind of kingdom he was creating. In John 18, he's before Pilate, who was in charge of all the Romans, in Jerusalem. And even Pilate was asking him about his kingdom. It's like, you're a king, so where's your kingdom? And Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were in this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered, into, delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Now, he did have some disciples that didn't understand that statement. He says, my disciples would rise up and fight. Well, he did have one who literally tried to do so. Just earlier in that chapter, in verse 10, is where you, you see Peter in the Garden of Gethsemane pull out his sword and chop off one of the soldiers' ears. He's like, ha-ha, finally, they're here to fight. And Jesus goes, Peter, you don't understand. This is, not, this is not the kingdom that I'm talking about. And the man that came to attack him, he healed his ears. Some of us are so hungry for fight when Jesus wants us to heal the people that came to attack us. So, hunger and thirst for righteousness. The hunger here is a painful hunger. It's a, it's a figuratively famished is a good way of saying it. Some of us crave is, is, is another way of saying it, is to be hungry is to crave, to have an ardent craving, an insatiable craving for a deeper fullness was one definition. But earthly cravings are only temporary. You ready to see what this is? You want to see what's under here? You ever have a craving and the only thing that would fix it a soda. <laughs> and a Craver case of White Castle. <laughs> they're a lot better warm. <laughs> and even then, they're not that good. <laughs> So yeah, they sell these in a case. Have you ever seen that? 
They call them a craver case. I don't even know how many are in them, but apparently there are 16 in this box. And I think I remember them being twice as big. It's been a long time since I, since I had one. I think I've already had it twice. It says it's made with real beef. <laughs> and American cheese, but we all know American cheese isn't real cheese anyway, right? <laughs> Anyone like White Castle? Some people do, right? They call them sliders. I think it's because they slide in and they slide out. <laughs> right? <sighs> How many all spiritual diet slides in and slides out? Where you leave service and you're like, what did pastor preach on again? I don't know, sliders. <laughs> Is that why they call them backsliders? Don't they come into church late, leave early? They slide in, slide out, whatever. Anyone ever noticing them? They don't ever have any real substance to them. The bread. I watched this video one time about communion. This was a long time ago before things even went viral. But it was this Catholic priest, and he was doing this, this uh, sampling of communion wafers. Like he had five or ten different communion wafers, and he would taste test them. And then he would give his commentary on what he thought of them, how they tasted. And then he looked at the box. He goes, looked at the nutritional value. He's like, huh, saturated fat, 0%. Cholesterol, 0%. Calories, 0%. Sugar, 0%. It's... There's nothing in it. He goes, and this is supposed to represent the body of Christ. And there is zero nutritional value in it. Like, I know we do the little communion wafers because it's convenient and the little thing. But that's not the body of Christ. The body of Christ is supposed to have substance and not just full of air. This is not bread. This is fluffy bun. You want real bread, get some good European German bread, right, Charity? Yeah. It's got real grain in there. It's, none of the, it's not all this processed stuff that someone else processed, and you don't even know what's in there. You know, some of us, our, our diet consists of someone else's opinion about what's in here rather than actually getting into this ourselves, right? Hunger and thirst for something legitimate that will stick with you regularly rather than something that just slides in and out of us. I'm going to regret that. <laughs> Hunger for something legitimate. Craver case. The thirst, interesting, I'm not going to spend too much time on the thirst in this, but the word there is talking about a painful feeling for one as well, an eager longing but it also is more of a figurative word uh, to do with things which the soul finds refreshing, supportive, and strengthening. Righteousness. Now, this is the big word. This is the big word from this. What are we hungering for? What is righteousness? The word righteousness is a kind of an important word in the Bible. It's in there hundreds of times throughout all of Scripture. The Bible tells us that the word is righteous. It tells us that he loves righteously. He calls, he says that God is righteous and that when he created the universe and the kingdoms, he founded it on righteousness, that he rewards righteousness in people. He called Abraham righteous. He called Noah righteous. And these are dudes that didn't do everything perfect, yet he called them righteous says that God is going to judge us in righteousness, that he had a covenant with his people, which is righteous. Psalm 23 says that he leads us in paths of righteousness. So you see, right, let me, you could open up a theological dictionary and turn to righteousness, and you would have about 30 pages worth of stuff to try and read through, just to try and define what righteousness is. But I want to try and summarize it with two main thoughts. 
Righteousness has to do with our relationship with him, being right with him, and it has to do with a lifestyle of living right as he intends. So the first one is a state of relationship. Romans 1, 17 puts it this way. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, ju the just shall live by faith. A different version when it's saying for it is talking about the gospel. Shows how to make people right. Because righteousness is about making people right with him. The gospel is what shows us what righteousness is. And righteousness is about making us right with God. The gospel, the good news, what Jesus did for us. The gospel is about how we, were, we are sinners without him. And that we cannot obtain righteousness. We cannot become perfect without him. You see, heaven is a perfect place. And for anything less than perfect, to enter that place which is perfect, we have to become perfect. Otherwise, for us to enter that perfect place, being less than perfect, would make that perfect place less than perfect. So Jesus had, God had to find a way to make us perfect in order to enter. When you ask people, how do you know that you're going to go to heaven? And their answer is, well, I'm better than most people. Right? That may be the case. But unless you're perfect, you can't enter that perfect place. You think God marks on the curve? He doesn't. A good way to illustrate this would be if every single one of us, our starting point was on the, uh, the West Coast, and the goal was to swim to Hawaii. How many think you could make it? You might be able to swim further than me. You might be able to swim further than most. But guess what? The guy that swims and sinks 100 yards from arriving still died. Same as the person who didn't even start. Didn't make it. Because unless you're perfect on your own strength, you're not going to make it. So how do you know you're going to go to heaven? Well, I've, I fulfilled the Ten Commandments. Oh, yeah? What are they? Even believers have a hard time quoting the Ten Commandments. So if you don't even know what they all are, how are you going to make sure you fulfill them all? And Jesus' standard's a bit higher. He's like, if you thought it in your mind, you might as well have done it. And if you've done this one, you've, done, you've basically done that one as well. So God had to find a way to make us righteous. That's what the gospel is. This verse... The second verse of Jira says, Going through a storm, but I won't go down. I hear your voice carried in the rhythms of the wind you call me out, which is kind of like when Peter was sinking. But this second part of it, you would cross an ocean so I wouldn't drown. It's as if God was in Hawaii and we're in California fitting <laughs> and we started this journey and along the way different ones of us started to sink along the way and God knew the only way for us to make it was for him to come down send his son to save us and he came on his boat and he didn't just throw us a, a life raft he jumped in the water with us he says here you take this I'll pay the price for you, and I'll go under. I will sink. I will go. I will die. This, this hit me this week. I, would, I didn't even always fully understand this. It's like, well, how did Jesus pay the price of eternity for us if he didn't stay down there for eternity? But you know, once you die, your physical body is only temporary, but your spirit is eternal. And, God, and Jesus and God was already eternal. So... He could go down there, be there for a moment, and it was as if he had been there for eternity. So he could pay every single one of our eternal price, our redemption, by coming, giving us the raft, 
going down, paying the price, coming up, and then moving on, saving the next one. And he did it all because he's an eternal being. So he could do that in three days easily. He didn't have to take three days, but he did. He paid the price for all of us, but you still have a choice. Are you going to take that life preserver? Are you going to get on the boat? Are you going to go all the way to Hawaii? I hear it's a nice place. Never been. That's the good news. Is that we can't be perfect on our own, but we don't have to. So it's about he makes us right. He sees us right. But then the second part is that it's about our lifestyle. Righteousness is about our lifestyle. In 1 John 2, 29, it says, You know that Christ is righteous. You should know then that everyone who does what is right is God's children. Anyone who does what is right, whoever is righteous, they are his children. There's this lie that's in the world right now that all humans are God's children. That's not what the Bible says. Not all of his creation are his children. It says those that are righteous and those that do righteousness, those are his children. Are you on the boat headed for Hawaii? If not, you're not one of his children. But you can be. But you can be. So righteousness is about integrity, virtue, purity of life, rightness, correctness, acting. It's justification. It's being just as if you had not sinned. Made to be just. Made to be right. Anyone ever gone to a chiropractor and had an adjustment? There's a bit of fear and trepidation the first time you ever do it. Micah went to the chiropractor a couple of years ago now, right? Already? He had this thing where he just kept doing this all the time. Went, took, took him to the chiropractor, and we were going to show the video, and he got this adjustment. He just sat there and went, ah. Just this satisfaction uh, of it being adjusted it means to be made straight, to be made right. That's what righteousness is. It's being allowed to be corrected, to be made straight, to be made aligned with him. And when we do this, when we make that choice, then we will be filled. The word filled means to be made full, to be corrected, to have that chiropractic adjustment, to be very satisfied. I'm about to close. I'm going to ask... You ought to bow your heads in a moment, not yet. I've got a couple verses, and then um, we're going to sing that song again. But it's Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Let's begin with, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just. As I'm reading through these, just let that word, things that are, not things that are not. We know what... We're against. Stop spending time focusing on things we're, that are not good, that are not true, which are not noble. Think of things that are true, that are noble, are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report. If there is any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Meditate on it. Chew on it. Take his word and Think on these things. Romans 3.22 We are made right in God's sight when we trust in Jesus Christ to take away our sins. And we all can be saved in this same way no matter who we are or what we have done. Romans 10, verse 9. If you confess your mouth with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For you believe with your heart, resulting in righteousness. And if you confess with your mouth, resulting in salvation. Let's pray. 
Father God, you said that you would provide your spirit for us and that he would live in us and that he would help us. He would help us to live righteously. You gave us your word as instructions on how to live righteously and you call it our daily bread, not just our weekly bread. Prompt us throughout this week, Father, to get into your word and chew on it. Not a physical paper, but God, your word, your truth, make us right with you. I'm going to ask for you all to repeat this simple prayer after me. And so it's a prayer of salvation. Whether this is your first time or just reminding yourself of that commitment that we've made for him to make us righteous. Just repeat after me. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son to save me. I turn from my wicked ways and I accept your forgiveness. Thank you for paying the price for my sin. And making a way for me to be righteous. I commit my life to you. To follow you. To listen to you. To let you be the Lord of my life. In Jesus name.